How is everybody? All right, we're going to go ahead and worship the Lord this morning. Everybody ready for that? All right, if you'll stand with us and sing along. Let's sing about grace. One, two, three, four. Welcome to worship. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. I'd like to welcome you to Ocoa Springs Baptist Church. If you're our guest, we're glad that you're here with us to worship the Lord today. We do have children's church, as we usually do, in building number two right across the parking lot. So when they're released for children's church, just head right out that door. If you're new to our church fellowship today as a guest, you can walk with your 
child over there, or if you feel like you need to walk with your child, feel free to do that, and pickup will be at that building um, as well after the service. So before we continue in worship through song and through praise, I want to draw your attention to Galatians chapter 2, looking at verse 15 and going through verse 21. Here you can kind of see Paul wrestling with the truth of the sacrifice of Christ at the cross, wrestling with justification being found through Christ alone. But then what does that mean for us? What's that picture look like? We've all wrestled with puzzles before, um, and, and this is one of those puzzles. He, he goes with what I know, what are, what are we wrestling with, what's the discussion, and what do I conclude? Here, looking at verse 15, he says, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. So Paul, being a Jew, speaking to other Jews, they refer to those who are not Jewish as Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus. So here he's drawing this picture. He goes, this is what I know. Nobody ever in the history of time, past, present, or future, will ever find themselves justified through their own endeavors, their own works, their own striving, their own righteousness. Jew or Gentile, not possible. He goes, this is what we've concluded. This is what we know. He says, so we believe in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. That's what he knows. That's what he believes. But what's the debate? What are they wrestling with? He says, but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners or in connection with Gentiles, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down... I prove myself to be a transgressor. So he's like, look, if, if we go back to this division of Jew and Gentile and we separate ourselves back out and we're not striving for, for unity in Christ and faith in Christ together, both Jew and Gentile, and I go back to putting everybody under the law. He goes, I'm rebuilding what I've torn down and what Christ has torn down. Guess what? I'm just proving myself to be a sinner. If I put myself back under the law, then all it does is reveal my sinfulness. So what's he conclude? For through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. See, we can debate and we can argue about all kinds of things, but one thing we cannot ignore is Jesus Christ went to the cross. He died a public death, and then he arose from the grave. What does that mean for us? Well, Paul draws a picture there. You can't be righteous on your own. You need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. If you're not a believer... That's where you need to be today, is in Christ. If you are in Christ, let's worship Him this morning. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for the day you've given us. We're thankful for our church family. We're thankful for the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Though we're sinners, and your word and your law shows us to be sinners, we have no argument. We have no stance before you on our own feet. So for believers here today, Lord, we worship you and we say thank you for Jesus Christ who lived the righteous life for us, who died our death on the cross, arose from the grave, and through faith we receive forgiveness of sin and peace with you based solely on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we praise you this morning for those who, who are here and they're striving, they're looking for other ways and they're wrestling with the truth of Scripture. Help them see who Christ is and their need for a Savior. So we worship you, we love you, and we praise you. Amen. Amen. You know, we didn't even uh, compare notes this morning, but we're going to sing about some of the exact same things. If you'll stand and sing with us, help us out when we talk about our Savior.
Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. just for just a second. This song means so much to so many people, and me included. Amazing Grace. There's a part here that talks about how precious did that grace appear. We talked a little about grace earlier. But the hour I first believed, and for those that are out there that are just kind of still wondering, there's, this is an amazing moment when you believe, when you finally cross over and believe that Jesus is your Savior, your chains are gone. Sing along. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me I once was lost But now I'm found Was blind But now I see 
was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are our children to children's church. Thank you for grace. Thank you for covering us over. We can't do it without you. We need you. And it's just unbelievable that you did what you did for us. Lord, we just pray that our hearts are clean and uh, you just bring us closer to you. And every day we get more and more desire in our hearts to be like you and to know you more through your word. Lord, I pray that your word is proclaimed mightily this morning and that it touches the hearts of everyone in this room. In your name we pray. Amen.
This morning we're going on a walk. We're walking to three different locations. First we're going to the briar patch and then we're going to the mountaintop and then we're going out the door. So I hope you wore your walking shoes today and you're ready to go. There's a purpose to our visits to these locations. We're looking for what we need from God. We were just singing about grace. What do we need from God in order to live out his plan for our lives? What is it that in different situations and in different scenarios and different things that we encounter in life, what is it that we need from God to to engage with, to maximize, to, to put into practice his will and his plan for our lives? And so we're walking today and we've been walking. We've been walking through the life of David. And so we've just kind of hitched our wagon to his wagon and we're just kind of walking along and and viewing what God did through this man's life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. This morning we'll be walking in 2 Samuel chapter 5. So I invite you to join me there, 2 Samuel chapter 5, and then we're going to walk to several different locations this morning. So, So first I need you to walk with me to Marengo County, Alabama. It's a pretty far piece, so you're going to burn some rubber on the bottom of your shoes today to get there. But walk with me, and now we're standing in Marengo County, Alabama, and we're standing right on the edge of the woods. We're right there on the edge of the woods, and we're about to walk into those woods. And we're, we're obviously there hunting, so if, 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 um, if you're not a hunter, then you're hunting by force today. Uh, you can just walk with us. So we're going to walk into those woods, and and, and we're going to try to get to a particular location. And, and as we begin to walk through those woods, we, we begin to go through. And there's something that is going to happen. I almost guarantee it's going to happen to, to some in the group today. As we walk through those woods, there's going to be a moment where you step and you're going to feel something kind of pull and hold you in place. It will have engaged with your coveralls. Maybe with your arm, your leg, and you'll find yourself right in the middle of a briar patch. You didn't notice it as you were walking through, but but as you got deeper and deeper in, suddenly you feel the tug. And and it's almost like they're alive. They're not. This is not a horror movie, but it's almost like they're alive. They reach out, they seem to, and they just grab you, and they hold you in place. You try to step, but you can't. And so as you're caught there by those briars, you have to make a decision. You're either going to stay caught by those briars or you're going to peel them off and they'll pop sometimes. It'll be almost like a poop, 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 poop. And sometimes that hurts because sometimes when you grab to peel them, you grab a briar. And sometimes when you step out of that one, you step into another one. And sometimes you need a buddy to help you because you're caught, it's on your back. You can't quite. So that's where we are today. We're walking through the woods. We end up in a briar patch. And what are you going to do about it? 2 Samuel chapter 5. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron. And spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Now, let's remember how we got here. Seven years before this, David had been anointed king of Judah only. The other tribes did not accept David as king. Only Judah, his his home tribe, so to speak. They're the only ones that acknowledge what God had said. The others, well, they were in disarray and ultimately they followed a son of Saul. But now he's been murdered. He's out of the way. There's been a long battle between the house of David and the house of Saul. We saw last week that David's house grew stronger and stronger. Saul's house grew weaker and weaker. And so now the rival king is out of the way. And now all the tribes come to David. All of them. 
And they're going to anoint him as king over all of Israel. So that's where we are. So these tribes come and they say, first of all, hey, David, we're going to anoint you as king because you're our kin. We're kin folks, right? You're our flesh and bone. We're, bone of, and we're your bone and your flesh. <clears throat> Secondly, verse 2, also in time past when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. David, you were the mighty warrior who led our armies out to battle. It wasn't Saul that was doing that. And we acknowledge you. You're the one that God used to protect our country, to protect our people, to defeat Goliath, to defeat the Philistines. You led our armies out. You led them back in. You are the mighty captain. You are the mighty warrior of Israel. And therefore, we acknowledge you as our king. But keep reading in verse 2. And the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. So they're, now they're acknowledging the plan of God. David, we, we've come here to anoint you as king. We've come to acknowledge who you are and God's plan for your life and for our country. We acknowledge that you're the king. We're going to anoint you. This, by the way, will be the third time David's been anointed as king. By Samuel, when he was a teenager. Then by Judah, the tribe of Judah, seven and a half years previous to this, and now by all of Israel. Three times he's been anointed as king when this passage will be completed. And so now we acknowledge that God is in this. God's the one that selected you. God's the one that said, you're going to shepherd my people, Israel, and you're the one who's to rule over my people. So David, we're coming to you. We're your kinfolk. And we acknowledge that you're our king. And, and you're the mighty warrior, David. You're the one that actually was the one leading in and out to battle. And David, this is God's plan. This is God's plan. And we want to engage with God's plan. You're, you're the shepherd that God has selected. Verse 3, therefore all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. And King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. This, this is an awesome day. Would you agree? In David's life, in the, in the life of the nation. <clears throat> this is awesome because they've been basically, there's been a civil war that's been raging. House of Saul, house of David. There was war between them. House of David, getting stronger and stronger, house of Saul getting weaker and weaker until ultimately God's plan was fulfilled and David is going to be declared king over all of Israel. You say, I don't see any briar patches there. I don't, I don't see any difficulties there. I don't see any problems. It all looks great. It looks like a celebration, and it is. It looks like, man, you'd have a big parade. It looks like a, you know, 4th of July deal where you pop some fireworks off and eat some barbecue, whatever. You know, this is awesome. This is, this is a great, great day in the life of Israel and in the life of David. And you'd be correct all the way around all of that. It's awesome. But I want you to think for just a minute how this could have been. Look at verse 5. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven, and a half, seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. David was king over Judah for seven and a half years, and then finally for 33 years over all Israel, totaling 40 years as king. But I want you to listen to me. In order for this day to happen as it did, in order for David to, to make a covenant with them, yes, I'll be your king, yes, I'll rule over you, yes, this is God's plan, in order for that to happen, David needed God's grace to help him get through the briar patch of what had happened in his life. Well, what had happened? Well, those people that are gathered there, they're saying all the right things, right? We're your kinfolk. You're a mighty warrior. God chose you. But all those things were true seven years ago too. You with me? So we roll the clock back seven years ago, and they should have been coming to David saying, you're our kinfolk, and you're the mighty warrior that's led our nation, 
And God selected you to be shepherd and we, we acknowledge you. So now, in a sense, we've wasted seven and a half years because they refused to acknowledge the plan of God and they fought against the plan of God and they fought against David as their king. They followed the wrong guy. They acknowledged the wrong guy. And so now as they're coming, and this is a great celebration. It's a great celebration because David received the grace of God to be able to pull the briars of the past off of his life and turn and face the future and engage today with God's plan for his life. How easy would it have been for David to say, oh, we acknowledge you as our shepherd. For David to say, where were you seven years ago? You ever feel like that? Where were you seven years ago? Why weren't you here seven years ago? Why have you fought me for seven years? It's the same people. These are the leaders. What, what? Oh, you're our kinfolk. Well, I was kin to you seven years ago. You see, it's very real. The briars of past hurt and disappointment can hold us in place and keep us from moving forward and engaging with God's plan for our life. It happens all the time. I bet it's happening right now in somebody's life. And if David would have said all of those things, he would have been right. They should have acknowledged him seven and a half years ago. There shouldn't have been this civil war that took place between the house of Saul and house of David. It was not God's, it was not God's primary plan. It's not what God said that he wanted to happen in the sense of who would be king. But they fought against it. And they're fighting against it, well, it made David's life really tough. It kept him from doing everything that he had hoped to do and dreamed to do as the leader of Israel. And he had to wait. But now on this day, when they come and they finally are acknowledging, there's no hint of that, is there? Is there? Does David even hint at anything other than, let's move forward? Praise the Lord. I engage with you in this covenant. I will be your king. And they come and they anoint David as king. There, there's no rehashing of the past. Because what had happened? Well, in a sense, David had reached down. He popped the briars off of his robe popped the briars off of his robe, and he stepped forward and said, look, I don't want to just keep reliving the past. I don't want to keep living in this briar patch. I want to move forward and engage with God's plan for my life, with God's plan for this nation. That's what I want to do, and that's what he did. And that's why it's a great day of celebration. But David needed God's grace to move beyond the hurt and disappointment of what had been going on for the last seven and a half years, because of some of those people right in front of him, he needed God's grace. Listen to me. You need God's grace. So we stand in the briar patch. <clears throat> Inevitably, we get caught. Somebody does something. Somebody says something. It hurts. Not denying that. And I'm not denying it's easy that you just snap your fingers and say, well, I'll forget it. That's why I've said you need God's grace. Because you won't be able to get past it. You'll live for 20 years caught in the briar patch. There's more woods out there, folks. There's more in front of you that God wants you to do, that God wants you to see. It doesn't mean that, that you, you say, well, hey, what happened to me was fine. It was not really that big of a deal. It may have been a really big deal. It wasn't fine. They shouldn't have done this. They shouldn't have fought with David for seven and a half years, but they did. And now they're coming, though, and they're acknowledging him as king, which is what God wanted all along, and David's ready. Let's engage with God's plan for the future. God has a plan for your life. He does. There's a reason for you, but there are a lot of briars in this world. They'll catch you. They'll hold you in past hurts. They'll hold you in anger, and they'll hold you in disappointments. You need God's grace to move beyond the hurt and disappointments of your past so you can engage with God's plan today and for the future. Sometimes it hurts to pull the briars off, doesn't it? 
It's easier just to stand still. If you just stand still in the briar patch and you're caught by briars, if they're not piercing you, then you'll be okay. But how long are you going to stand in the briar patch? Some people do it for years. Oh, not literally, but in their life. Well, my son said this to me, and I'll never forgive him for that. Well, maybe it's time to pull that briar off. And ask for God's grace to forgive and to move forward with God's plan for your life. You need God's grace to help you get out of the briar patch and engage with his plan for your life. But there's something else we need. Walk with me to another location. We're going out to Colorado. We're going to the Rocky Mountain National Park. It's a great place, beautiful place. I want you to walk with me up the Sky Pond Trail. Now, it's like a 10-mile round trip. But to get to the Sky Pond, as we, as we get closer and closer, it's mid-June. Really didn't expect snow mid-June there. But as we got higher and higher, there was. There was quite a bit of snow and ice on the trail. So you get to a certain point where you're, 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 you're right at a spot where you've got to decide, are you going to go forward or are you going to turn back? What's going to be your decision? So what you're looking at, you, you, we've reached up, we're at about 10,500 feet, something like that. And, and the sky pond and the lake of glass are right up there. You can't see them, they're up there because in order to get up there, you've got to cross this patch of snow and ice that slants like that. And it just goes down to some rocks down there. And then if you get across that, then you've got a rock scramble up a 100-foot waterfall. And then when you get up there, then you're at the lake of glass, and then you hike a little further, and you're at Sky Pond. And so you, you evaluate it. People that are coming down, you, you, you just have on like summer hiking shoes, okay? They're not even waterproof. No spikes. You've got a, a walking stick from Walmart. Yeah, like the kind that you can just like telescope out and make it the right height, but it's from Walmart. It's $9. <laughs> Not exactly mountaineer equipment. And so you look at all of that and you have to make a decision. What am I going to do? Are we going to turn back or are we going to go for it? And everybody coming down says, you shouldn't try that. Because you're walking over, you're asking them, look, we don't have any spikes or anything. I know that you've got spikes. Would you recommend? No. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's, it's, the sun is melting the ice and it's, it's, it's free freezing and it's really, I, I just wouldn't recommend it. So you come over with your wife and your daughter over to the side and you say, look, and, and by the way, it's late in the afternoon. Well, it is for this time because it's almost 2 o'clock and they say you need to be off the mountain before 2 o'clock because that's when the thunderstorms roll in and um, you can't see them coming because of the mountains. They're there. So be off the mountain by 2 o'clock because you don't want to be up there in a lightning storm. Where are you going to hide? What are you going to do? Okay, so it's, it's about 1.30 maybe pushing 2 o'clock. Clouds are look like they're building in, and so you come over and you have a consultation, and, and you say, um, you know what, everybody's recommending that we not go forward. We, we, we just have on these hiking shoes. They're good shoes, but they're just, they're not made for ice and snow. We don't have any spikes. We got Walmart hiking poles. Uh, it's late in the day. We don't know what's right over that mountain. It's the time when st clouds are pouring in here. It looks pretty rough. And, and this is a quote. We'd be pretty stupid to go ahead and do this. And then you look at your wife and say, let's do it. <laughs> your wife has enough to sense to say, I'm not doing it. You and your daughter, <laughs> well, we did it. 
And it was hairy. It was difficult. It was scary. It was challenging. What about you? Are you turning back? Or are you going to go for it? Look at verse 6. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David saying, you shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David, that's what he renamed it. Now David said on that day, whoever climbs up by way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, the lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Therefore, they say, the blind and the lame shall not come into this house. Then David dwelt in the stronghold and called it the city of David, and David built all around from the millow and inward. So David went on and became great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. I want you to think about something. As I, as I explain this to you, I want you to think about what's your Jerusalem? What's your Jerusalem? Understand, God doesn't always call us to play it safe. He just doesn't. Now, we don't need to be foolish and reckless, but let's understand, in the plan of God, we need boldness. We need boldness from God to do what needs to be done. You're going to need grace from God to let go of things in your past in order to move forward into the future. But also you're going to need boldness from God to go where you've never gone before and to do what needs to be done. David decided to take Jerusalem and make it his capital. The inhabitants of Jerusalem, the Jebusites, they mocked him. They said, look, if we put blind people and crippled people on the wall, you couldn't take this place. The lame and the blind could defend it. They couldn't even see you, and they couldn't even move from place to place. It's so secure, you can't take Jerusalem. You can't do it. They had a point. Now, I tried to figure out, how long was it from Joshua when God brought the people into the promised land to David? Because when Joshua came into the promised land, God told them, take all of the land. They did that halfway, but they never took Jerusalem, ever. The Jebusites still live there. They still control that area. One of the reasons is it's really hard to take Jerusalem. Um, they weren't kidding. I mean, there's some exaggeration there. The, the lame and the blind could defend it, but, but they had a point. The reason none of you guys, none of the tribes have taken it is because it's really hard. In fact, it's well nigh impossible we could defend this thing with, with even with blind people. But David said, no, we're taking Jerusalem. From, from Joshua to David, you read a lot of different estimates. I read many. But the most common range is 350 to 450 years. Kind of hard to figure it out exactly. But think about that. 350 to 450 years. Almost 500 years on the top side of that, that, that Israel had been in the land, but the Jebusites had kept Jerusalem. Nobody could take it. Nobody even tried to take it. They just left it alone. It's impossible. We don't do that. We just, we just live around them. But David had the boldness to say, we're taking Jerusalem. We're going up there. We're taking that city, and it's going to be my capital city. It's going to be the capital of Israel. That took a lot of boldness, didn't it? Because it had never been done before. The last words of a, of a church sometimes are, we've never done it that way before, right? <laughs> oh, we've never done it that way before. Well, okay, that doesn't mean we should do it that way, but that's also not a disqualifier that we shouldn't do it that way. See, we need to seek the plan of God, but we need to have boldness to engage when God leads us. We look at something and say, you know what, that looks really challenging. That looks really tough. It doesn't mean we should just jump right into it, but it means, God, what do you want us to do? And clearly, this was the plan of God for David's life and for Israel. Why? Well, 
It's a new day. David's now king over all of Israel. If he keeps his capital in Hebron, where he's been the king for seven and a half years, that's associated almost exclusively with Judah. It's a new start. He recognizes we need a new capital. Hmm, I think it'll be Jerusalem. Also, it's neutral. No tribe has ever possessed it. So if we stay in Hebron, the other tribes are going to say, well, David, he, he does things for Hebron and Judah that he doesn't do for the rest of us. And you end up with a division and a split. But if we go to a neutral location, which, by the way, was the original intent of a Washington, D.C., right? It doesn't belong to any state. It's a neutral place where all the states can um, kind of mess that up, right? <laughs> Over, over time. But that was the original plan. It it's doesn't belong to any particular state. It's its own neutral. And so David's like Jerusalem. It's a neutral site. And you say, well, that's good thinking on David's part, but where does God engage? Think of Jerusalem in the plan of God. Things unknown to David. Clearly God is leading David in this venture. Clearly God is all over this. You see, it's Jerusalem. That's where the temple is going to be. So the central house of worship it's going to be in Jerusalem. David didn't know that, but it had to be taken. And for 350 to 450, for all of that time, almost, almost, if you go to the upper side of that, if you're in Florida, you're almost back, not quite, but almost back to Ponce de Leon. Not quite, or if you don't know who that is, Ponce de Leon, right? <laughs> all right. That's the Alabama way to say it, Ponce de Leon. I, I came... One time we were passing through Florida, and um, <clears throat> I, I was asking the workers about the Fountain of Youth. You know, I said, you know, the one that Ponce de Leon was looking for. They're like, who? What? You know, Ponce de Leon. I mean, how do you say the last word? It's Leon in Alabama, right? And they're like, do you mean Ponce de Leon? And these were Burger King workers. And I'm like, well, yeah, probably that's what I mean. Yeah, probably, probably that guy. <laughs> yeah, the fountain of youth guy, Ponce, Ponce de Leon. <laughs> well, that's a long time, right? And, and from David back to Joshua, not quite that long, but almost back that long, and that's a fur piece back. And nobody's done it. Nobody's done it. But with boldness, David says, we're going to do this. And think of God's plan again for Jerusalem. Not only the center of worship, but think in the future. Think of this is where Christ will be crucified. This is where he'll be raised. This is where one day he'll reign. Jerusalem, central to God's plan. But it took somebody looking out and saying, well... For 350, 400 years, none of us have ever taken that. It'd be really stupid to try that. Let's do it. Boldness from God. You see that same boldness, by the way, don't you, in the book of Acts? When the disciples could have said, boy, it'd be really stupid for us to really talk about Jesus anymore after all this happened. But let's do it. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit filled them with boldness. And they testified of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's not happened in your life that needs to happen? It's God's plan, but it hasn't happened yet. You've turned away from it. You've, you've shied away from it because it's difficult. It's hard. Maybe it's outside the box. Maybe it's risky. But it's God's plan. So will you keep sitting there looking at it or will you go for it? We need boldness from God to go for it when clearly that's his plan. We shouldn't think of stupid things to do. We shouldn't think of things, well, that looks hard. Let's try it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying as God is leading us, and clearly God was leading David to take Jerusalem. Look at, look at it from this side. Clearly God was leading David to do that. But it took boldness. It took courage. And he said, hey, to his, to his soldiers, anybody that can get up in there, I'll make you commander in chief of the army. You'll be the captain of the army. And Joab, his nephew, got up in there, went up the water shaft. 
he found a way. And he got up in there and they ended up taking the city that the inhabitants said, David, he can't come up in here. We, we could defend this with blind people. We need boldness from God to dare to do what needs to be done. What needs to be done in your world? What needs to be done in your life? Maybe no one's done it. Maybe God puts it on your heart to be the one. You know, we don't need to find a new purpose, but, but we do need boldness to gain ground for God, new ground for the kingdom of God. We're very timid. We crave the easy path. We don't want to engage with something if it looks like it might be hard or difficult. But God calls us to dare to do what needs to be done as a church. He calls us to dare to do what needs to be done in our families, in this community, in our own lives. We need boldness from God to do what needs to be done. Maybe no one's ever shared the gospel with your dad. You need boldness from God to do what needs to be done. Maybe no one's ever <clears throat> shared the gospel with your friend. You need boldness from God to do what needs to be done. How will you engage? What's your Jerusalem? Where is God leading you? You see, from the life of David, as we walk with David, we go into the briar patch. Man, there are things we've got to pull off and let go in order to move on. But then there are some challenges over there, some mountaintops that they're difficult to get to. And if we only do what we've always done, probably won't get up there. God calls us not to make up stuff, not to just try to do stuff because it seems hard, but to follow his plan and follow his will for our life. And sometimes that's going to take us right up there to Jerusalem to do what needs to be done. One final thing, one final sight. <clears throat> I need you to walk with me out of that chair and out that door. You say, well, I plan to in just a few minutes. Fair. <laughs> What's next for you? What's waiting out there for you? How do you know what to do? How will you know what to do? When you face the challenges in your life, what should you do? And there will be challenges. Well, let's take a look. Skip down to verse 17. Now, when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David, and David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. The Philistines all also well, they're, they're after him now. They figure out this guy's not just some uh, low-level player anymore. He's the king of Israel, and they're our enemies. So they go down, and they, they deploy. And, and what should David do? Well, David knows what to do. He's the one that led the, led the armies out and led them back in, right? So he, he knows how to do this. You go out and you fight. You go out and you go to battle. That sling, sword, bow, whatever, spear. You go out and you fight. You throw down. David, he knows, I'm going to go out and I'm going to fight the Philistines and I'm going to win the battle as the new king of Israel. But wait a minute. Before he did that, there's something that you need to do before you do what you're about to do. Verse 19. So David inquired of the Lord. You see that? He asked God saying, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? So David is aware that the battle is the Lord's. It's not just based on his skill and his wisdom as a leader. Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, go up. I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. And he goes up and he defeats them. He names the place um, a breakthrough. It's like a breakthrough of waters that God broke through on his enemies on that day. So what did David do when he faced a challenge in his life, i.e. the Philistines? He inquired of the Lord and God directed him. 
And God said, I want you to go up exactly what you were thinking. I want you to go up. I want you to meet them on the battlefield. I want you to fight them. And I want you to defeat them. And that's exactly what happened. In fact, it was such a great defeat. Verse 21, the Philistines, they left their images there. And David and his men carried them away. So all their pocket idols, little house idols, little pocket trinkets of different gods that they had that represented those gods, they dropped those and ran. And David and his men find them all over the battlefield, all over the place. Just the battlefield strewn with these little idols. They take them away and destroy them. David inquired of the Lord. But they come back. Verse 22. Then the Philistines went up once again. They deployed themselves in that same valley. Therefore David inquired of the Lord and said, watch it now, this is where it gets tricky in life. When you face the challenges of life and you do ask God, what do you want me to do? And he tells you, this is the way I want you to handle this challenge. And you do it and it works. It's hard to change that the next time, right? Because if it worked, let's do that same thing again. You with me? So if, if, you're, a, if you're a baseball pitcher. And there's a particular batter that comes up, and the last time he came up, he's a great hitter, and he comes up, and you threw, you threw a fastball, and then a curveball, and then a sinker, and you struck him out. The next time he comes up, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to throw a fastball, and then a curveball, and a sinker, because that's what worked last time, right? Okay, but watch it. David inquired of the Lord, and God said to him, you shall not go up. No, we're not doing this like we did last time. Circle behind them. Come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly, for then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. So David did so as the Lord commanded him, and he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. I think this is really important. The third thing you need from God, not only do you need grace from God to get those briars off that are holding you back, to hurt the disappointment, not only do you need boldness from God to say, God, I'm here, and if you you want me to take Jerusalem, we're going. We're not stopping, we're going. But there's a third thing you need from God. You need direction from God as you face the challenges of life because, quite frankly, we don't know what we're supposed to do all the time we have principles in scripture and we have we have commands in scripture that guide us but should you take that job or not you need to inquire of the Lord should you leave that job or not well you better inquire of the Lord and find the mind of God so you need direction from God Should you put your kid in that school or that school? Well, you you should inquire of the Lord. And don't just assume that you know. We need direction from God. And, And as far as methods, not purpose, but as far as methods, sometimes God leads us to, to tackle a challenge in one way, and the next time that challenge comes, he may lead us to tackle that challenge in a different way. Not the same way. So we can't just live the Christian life with ditto marks. Well, next week, ditto. Next week, ditto. Next week, ditto. I've told you about the guy, and you've seen him. Puts up the Christmas display with the roller coaster and all that. It's, it's great unless you live in that neighborhood, right? It's awesome unless you've got to fight the traffic. And then his neighbor puts up the sign across the street that points and says, ditto. That's awesome. But you can't live the Christian life like that. You can't just ditto. You need to inquire of the Lord. That requires a dependence upon God. That requires that we walk with God, walk with God, actually. Not just just check out and go through the motions and then assume that we know what we're supposed to do. No, we have to stay in touch with God. We have to walk with him. Hence the whole theme of this message. I ask you to walk with me. And we've been walking through David's life Because our journey is a walk with the living God. 
It's a living, real relationship. Again, I'm not talking about purpose. God's purpose, we see that clearly in Scripture. I'm talking about how do we fulfill that purpose? Different, different strategies that we may use to accomplish what God wants to accomplish in this world, what he leads us to accomplish. And those do change. If you don't believe that, start a cassette tape ministry. The message on the tape may be incredible, but who can even hear it anymore? Do you have a cassette player? Anybody? Does anybody have a cassette player that you use? Okay, we got one, we got two. We got three. Do I have four? Four, 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 five. No, not many, not many. It's just not many. So that message that was on that cassette years ago when we used to do cassette ministry and that message doesn't ever change. If it does, we got problems. But the method of delivery sometimes does change. It just does. God, what do you want us to do? Lord, what approach should I take now? We must seek the Lord. We must continue to seek the Lord. We can't just go through the motions. We have to inquire of the Lord. Now quickly, how does God guide us? Well, he guides us through his word, the Bible. We need to be students of the scripture. He guides us through his word. There are, there are precepts in the word and principles in the word. What's the difference? The precept is like this. Speed limit, 35. That's a precept. It says, this is it. 35 is the speed limit. A principle is a sign that says, drive carefully. It doesn't tell me how fast. It just says you need to drive carefully. And then I have to take all that I know about driving and about being careful and cautious and bring it to bear right there on that road. And, and that, that's a principle, drive carefully. It doesn't tell me how fast. And you and I, as we live the Christian life, as we engage with the Lord, listen to me. Oh my, there are things that God says, do this, and we always must do those. There are things that God says, don't do this, and we always don't want to do those. But then there are principles where we, we seek wisdom to apply the principles of Scripture. We seek that wisdom from God. God, what do you want us to do? He guides us in answer to prayer. Another one. He guides us by the Holy Spirit. And when you know what God wants you to do, do it. That's what David did. Lord, shall I go up? Nope, wait. Look, we're going to do this differently. I want you to circle around over here, and you're going to hear the sound of marching in the mulberry trees. What in the world was that? I don't know. It was the sound of marching in the mulberry trees. It doesn't tell us exactly what, what that was, what God did. Except for when you hear that, you'll know it's go time. And David did that. He didn't say, well, last time, God, you told us to do it this way. No, he was obedient to the Lord. Listen, to live the life that God calls you to live, you need God. And you need grace from God. Now, how do you engage with that? Well, the first thing you need is saving grace. Because you certainly can't engage with grace for life, to live life, if you've not received the grace of God through Christ as it relates to salvation. You need to be saved. If you're here today and you're not saved, you're not a Christian, well, that's, that's the first thing. You, you'll never get the briars off. They'll hold you forever without the grace of God demonstrated through faith in Christ, the saving grace of God. So I encourage you, if you've never trusted Christ, to come to Jesus. Come to, I'd love to talk to you about what that means. Come to Jesus. His grace was demonstrated on the cross where he did for us what we could never do for ourselves. He paid the penalty for our sins. And those that turn to him in repentance and faith, he saves us. We're recipients of his grace. We become trophies of his grace. Saving grace. But the Bible also talks about his, his grace is sufficient for our life, his all-sufficient grace, so that when we face challenges in life, God says, my grace is sufficient for you. So you've been hurt, you've been wounded deeply, I want to tell you something, God's grace is sufficient for you. Don't say it'll be easy, don't say it'll be, um, that it won't be messy, it might be. 
but you've got to get out of that briar patch. David was not going to be trapped endlessly in that seven and a half years when people, the other tribes didn't accept him as king. Now they are, okay, let's move forward. Now I'm not saying there's nothing he had to work through. There probably was, we're not told. But if you want to move forward, you've got to peel those briars off and you need the grace of God to do that. What briars do you need to pull off of your life today so you can move forward with God? We need boldness. We need boldness from God to dare to do what needs to be done. God is calling you to do something that takes you outside of your comfort zone. What's your Jerusalem today? You say, well, I'm not sure. Well, start asking God. God, what, what's my Jerusalem? It may not be a Jerusalem to anybody else. They may say, oh, that's simple. That's easy. But to you, it might be a big deal. And you need direction from God to know how to handle the challenges of life. If you don't face any challenges in your life, then you can go ahead and start packing up. You, you won't need anything else. But if you happen to be someone who faces challenges in life, when you walk out of here, you know there's some challenges that are facing me in my life that I've got to deal with. What are you going to do? Well, you need direction from God to know what to do. You need to ask the Lord. Inquire of the Lord. But will you? A lot of challenging times in our life through the years. Lots of difficulty at different points and lots of great things. I would say from early November, actually all the way through the last couple of weeks. Lots of unsettling challenges. What are we going to do with those things? Well, we need direction from God. We need wisdom to God, from God. God, what do you want us to do? Will you ask God today? You're about to go out the door. You've already been here a little bit longer than you thought you would be. You're, you're, you're about to get out of that chair. You're not, you're not literally walking in Marengo County, Alabama, and you're not in the Rocky Mountain National Park. You're going right out there, back to your life. God has a plan for your life. You need his grace. You need boldness. You need direction. Will you seek those things? from God. Let's stand together. Lord, help us now. Lord, this is <clears throat> this is um it's it's challenging for us. It's it maybe easy to talk about or think about, but we're we're going right out there back into our lives and Lord, there there are challenges that we have to face. And we need you. But Lord, sometimes we just face those challenges on our own. We either disengage, try to hide from them, or we think we can handle it ourselves, and neither of those are the right things to do. God, we need you. We need your grace. Lord, we need boldness to dare to do what you've called us to do and put us here in this world to do. And, oh, God, we need your wisdom. We need direction. Help us to seek your face and seek you because these things come from you. So, really, what we need is you. Work in our lives right now. Help us to do what needs to be done. In Jesus' name. Amen. What will it be like when my pain is gone and all the worries of this world just fade away? What will it be like when you call my name and that moment when I see you face to face I'm waiting my whole life to hear you say well done 
well done, my good and faithful one. Welcome to the place where you belong. Well done, well done, my beloved child. You have run the race and now you're home. Welcome to the place where you belong. What will it be like when tears are washed away and every broken thing will finally be made whole? What will it be like coming to your glory? Standing in the presence of a love so beautiful. Waiting my whole life to hear you say, I will live my life to hear you say, Well done, well done, my good and faithful one. Welcome to the place where you belong. Well done, well done, my beloved child. You have run the race and now you're home. Welcome to the place where you belong. What will it be like? When I hear that sound, all of heaven's angels crying out, singing holy, holy, holy are you, Lord, singing holy, holy. Singing holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. I'm waiting my whole life for that day. Until then I'll live to hear you say, well done. Be seated for just a second, please. Just a few words of announcement before you.